Good afternoon. Welcome to the Asian Development Policy Lecture. This is the first hybrid lecture that you're seeing. So we have over 130 now uh, participants and uh, we heard the number will increase to over 300 probably. And then we have uh, nearly full house here in person. So it's uh, a great pleasure to moderate the session today. We have a special guest, Vic Adamovic. And um, he will speak with us about the importance to assign value to the merit of the benefits of nature and um, align economic decisions with ecological conversation. Over lunch, I had a, a conversation with one of our economists, Martino, and he said economics started actually with nature and really thinking about how we use um, nature capital. And then it you know, evolved, as you all know. So it will be very interesting to hear today from WIC who is a distinguished university professor in the Department of Resource Economics and Environmental Sociology at uh, the University of Alberta. Um, he's also the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Agriculture, Life and Environmental Science, and he has published hundreds of uh, refereed publications and had impact on policy all over the world. Um, and interestingly, he has worked with the Philippines over around 20 years already. Um, with um, lecturers and uh, researchers from University of the Philippines and others. So uh, we will hear now from Vic um, in detail about the latest research and thinking, and then we'll come to our panel and uh, exchange some reflections on Vic's presentation. So the stage is all yours. Thanks, Susan. It, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here and the wonderful people I've met, and to see old friends and colleagues that uh, we've been friends for years. So it's really great to be back in Manila. Uh, Martino's been an outstanding host. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's been really a fantastic time. And I'd love to talk about this subject. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about ecosystem service valuation or natural capital valuation and economics and policy. Um, I had to start with this old picture because that's it's a little grainy, but that's that's me and a bunch of folks around a computer. Maybe even some of the folks in the audience see themselves in that picture. Uh, back in 20, 2010 in Manila, um, not too far away, teaching courses. So it's nice to be back in the region and it's nice to continue to chat about these types of issues. So what am I going to talk about? Um, why would we value natural capital and ecosystem services? Um, what, what, for what purpose? Um, what is it? What methods do we use? Uh, maybe a little reflection on whether it's actually made a difference. Uh, most of these would be from the developed world examples that I have, but where has it shown up in policy or in decision making where it's actually had an impact? Uh, what challenges are we facing associated with the valuation of natural capital? Um, it's, it's not all finished, it's not all perfect, which is good because it keeps people like me in the research world in business and keeps us busy trying to think about how to solve some of the challenges. But then we really have some exciting frontiers as well in this area that uh, I think we've been talking about over this past week and uh, I hope to see continued action on what those frontiers are. Actually, maybe even before I start, you know, when I was reflecting on this last night, I was thinking, you know, to think about all this economics and investment decisions and large scale projects and how do they affect natural capital and how do we incorporate that. I really think it's, you can almost think about it as a personal issue. And I think about the last home that I bought with my family. It's an investment, it's probably the biggest investment that most people make. And nature played a role. We had a park nearby our house and we thought, oh yeah, that's nice, that's fine. Maybe there was a bit of a trade off that we perhaps liked that park. And so we maybe had a, a slightly smaller house perhaps, but we were able to live next to the park. But the value that that natural capital has provided for us, for the children when they were there and small and able to participate and enjoy that and we could watch and interact with nature, the value that was generated during the pandemic, that we had access to nature, that we could go out and you saw property values rise associated with places that had proximity to nature. So we've learned, we've learned more about the role of natural capital in our investments and maybe think more about, well, maybe there are really important trade-offs to be made there and judgments about the value of natural capital in that kind of decision-making that we make personally 
And here we'll talk about it for broader scale decisions of investments and policy and such. And I think there are really some parallels between what we as individuals do and the way that we think about trade-offs and values and also how we make these kind of decisions at national or regional scales. So why value ecosystem services? And why do it in dollar terms? I mean, there are many ways to value natural capital and systems from a, a broad philosophical perspective, but I'm an economist, so I'm maybe very reductive, and I think about doing this in dollar terms. And I do it in dollar terms because that gives me a common measuring stick. I can then compare the importance of the natural capital in monetary terms against other elements, the importance of other kinds of outputs or goods and services, and where's the right balance or the right trade-off. And that gives me a measuring stick that I can use. And I can use that in this, as on the slides, investment decisions, including investing in nature. I think we're gonna hear later today about maybe we wanna invest directly in nature because it's valuable for us and we want to realize that value. Um, financing green investments, also avoiding depreciation of nature. If it's something that's valuable to us, maybe we wanna reinvest in it to bring up the value of that asset, or we wanna restore something that we've damaged, and I'll have an example of that in a minute. In a lot of cases, it informs regulatory analysis. If we have a particular regulation that we're trying to put in place for pollution control or for you know, some other transportation decision, Maybe the environment needs to play a role. What are the environmental benefits from those policies or regulations? What are the environmental costs? And to talk a little bit about the possibility of using these methods as compensation for damages. If somebody harms the environment, should they be held liable for that harm? And could valuation play a role in sending a signal that this is important, that nature is important, and that there could be a fine or a penalty associated with that damage? There are a couple of frontier issues that I, I want to talk about. One is that economists usually think about the value in aggregate. What is the value to the country or to the region? But we also need to think about who wins and who loses, or who wins more and who wins less, the distributional impacts of our policies. We can think about that through an environmental valuation lens. Who benefits most in terms of the environmental value from a particular policy? Is it people who are already wealthy, or is it poor people who benefit? We can then think about how we would assess that kind of trade-off and what we're doing to the distribution of income. And last, I'm gonna talk about some things that we've seen very recently in the literature is that nature's values are increasing over time. And we have to think about that as we plan for the future. If we're doing investment analysis for 10, 20, 30 years, those values are increasing over time. So let's talk about some of these examples. This last slide and last point in bullets, the, th the thing that really makes me most excited about this field is just the change over the last decade. The advances in the tools, the science, the data capabilities, the technology that students are now deploying that really advances our ability to think about values, but also to think about where and who and how people benefit from nature services. So that's something that I'll, I'll come back to at the end about the, the things that we're seeing on the horizons. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of examples. Some of them are a bit self-serving because they're ones that I've been involved in, but they're the ones that I can speak most comfortably about. And this is work that we did in, in Panama. And it was an interesting problem. It wasn't an investment decision in terms of a new project. It was really to try to address a problem. And as some of you are aware, because of climate change and, and drought conditions, sometimes the Panama Canal has less water in it or has draft restrictions. And that affects economic activity. That affects revenues from the canal to the government agencies, it affects the livelihood of people. And part of the reason for that is that the watershed in that area really saw a depreciation in its natural capital. Historically, it was logged, the watershed wasn't able to store the water through time, and so it went away from the landscapes, it didn't stay in the canal, and so we had this imbalance that was created. So this project, which has an aptly named title given the topic of the seminar, Assessing Ecological Infrastructure Investments, so what if we invested in nature? What if we invested in that watershed and worked with landowners to grow trees, to rethink how they do their silvopastoral work, to think about growing coffee? For somebody who loves coffee, that's a pretty cool thing to be in the field talking to people about. So what if we could look at that as an investment? Is it a good investment? Is it something that would return a benefit relative to what it would cost? 
So we worked in the watershed. We worked on assessing what it would cost. Notice this, that we see space, so we knew where things would be maybe less costly or more costly. We knew where they would have more of an impact, a benefit on the canal and the water flow. So we knew how those might influence the outcomes. We also looked at, the, at what impact it would have on the revenues associated with the canal or the benefit side. So this graph is a little confusing, but those lines on the bottom, those they're almost vertical lines, are really saying, here's the additional benefit. If you put more hectares into these new agroforestry programs or the timber programs, you're gonna generate benefits in dollar terms. Benefits that we can measure associated with better transport through the canal. If we look at the lines going the other way, that's what it's gonna cost us because it's gonna cost us in technical assistance. It's gonna cost us in, in compensating the landowners and we knew what it would cost as you put more acres into the system. So we're really doing a benefit cost analysis. And what did the benefit cost analysis tell us? It said, yes, it's worth, it's worth investing. It's worth investing to a point. I think that's the other piece. How big should this project be? Should we reforest the whole watershed? Probably not, too expensive compared to the benefits, but we could find the right level that we could invest in to generate benefits relative to the cost. And again, it's an investment in nature services that turned up in revenues, in financial returns for the country, for the agencies. So one example. This example is from my country in Canada, and it's actually an interesting combination of ideas. That's a threatened species in my country. That's the boreal caribou. Um, if, if anybody's been to Canada, I know a few folks have, our, one of our coins has that animal on the coin as a symbol of nature, if you will, in our country. That animal is now a threatened species because of industrial activity, a whole host of other features. My colleague Eli Fenichel worked with a couple of other uh, folks from Yale and I to look at it two ways. One way was to look backwards. This is natural capital accounting to say, how are we doing? How's our, our natural capital account in these animals doing? And what we found is that they were depreciating the monetary value associated with the economic activity, real monetary value because of the effort in restoration was showing a decline in the asset. That's called the conservation debt. So we were actually experiencing a debt over time. But the article also looked forward and said, well, what, what would it be worth to reinvest in those, to restore those ecosystems? Would there be value in those? And we found that answer as well. That yes, there were positive, significant positive benefits there's now a, a program in the Canadian government. It's published under the formal Canada Gazette as a regulation showing the benefits and costs of restoring boreal caribou as part of the outcome of this work and other work. I think it all also lines up for some of you may have been here last week for Eli Fenichel's lecture on natural capital. Natural capital is really giving us a scorecard to say, how have we done over time the natural capital accounting methods? What I'm talking about is the looking forward side for benefit cost analysis, how do we value investments in nature? Do they generate returns for us? So both the backwards and the forwards looking came together in this work. The other thing I mentioned was compensation and, and of course the cases that we have in North America are what are the penalties for damaging nature? And an institutional framework where if, if an entity does harm to natural systems, that makes the public worse off the public could be compensated for this. This is the Deepwater Horizon case. I've never seen the movie. I don't know if anybody's seen the movie. Apparently it's a very good movie. Um, I can't bear watching it, but it's a, it's a case where there was damage to the natural environment. The mechanism there is to send the signal that there needs to be compensation to the public. So the determination of that compensation is part of environmental valuation. How do you measure that number? How big is it? obviously very interesting discussions about how you measure it and how it gets distributed. But maybe more importantly, it's actually a signal to, the, to entities of various kinds that if you do harm to the environment, there could be a penalty. That's true in the institutions in the United States. It's true in the Canadian institutions that fines and penalties can be determined through environmental valuation if there's a damage to the environment, particularly one that's associated with a liability. So another example of where valuation links with nature and ties in with economic policy. This is very recent work, um, just a little over a month ago, uh, published in Science, that 
tells us that these values of ecosystem services in real terms are increasing through time. And we need to capture that in our investment analysis and our benefit cost analysis. Uh, theoretical work as well as empirical work just showing how that's happened over time and how if we don't factor that in, we're undervaluing the contribution of na na nature to our benefit cost analysis. So another reason to think about nature services. Accounting for equity. As I mentioned, who benefits more, who benefits less, or perhaps who wins and who loses. Again, over the last decade in my profession, this has been the interest of students. They really want to work in this field to understand the distributional impacts of policy and how they can address environmental justice. And environmental valuation plays a role because it helps us understand where those benefits flow, benefits or costs. Um, this is one of my colleagues, Amy Ando, who's written some fantastic work about how do we build equity and cost effectiveness into valuation, in this case around biodiversity conservation. Because we have to think now not just about the, the size of the pie, but who's getting the pie in different places. The last example I'm going to present, and this is not so much environmental valuation, but it's really the linkage between nature and economies. This is work out of the World Bank. Uh, Justin Johnson out of the University of Minnesota was the lead of this work. Partly this illustrates the advances that we've made in the field. And there's a lot of words and acronyms on this slide, but essentially what they're doing is they're taking a global trade model, an economic trade model, GTAP, and linking it to ecosystem services models saying how those ecosystem services will affect our economy and our trade and trade patterns. And one of their projections is a bit depressing, a projection is that if there's a shock to the system, to the ecosystem that's uh, described in this particular scenario, there'll be significant declines in GDP. Not, a, not an economic welfare measure, but a signal of what our economies are doing. And you can see that they've also split them out regionally, that the shocks will be distributed differently across the world. Just a fascinating data initiative, uh, machine learning and a whole host of other new technologies to try to link nature and our economies. So how do we do this? Well, for me, it's really linking people, people's behavior, people's preferences back to nature. Some of it comes through market goods because nature helps us produce food. It helps us produce forests. It helps us with fisheries. It's part of what we combine our own knowledge and skills and capital to generate. So those, those are one piece of the natural valuation studies. Um, of course, we've been learning recently over the last couple of decades about the value of uh, greenhouse gas emissions or the cost of greenhouse gas emissions. That's another connection. I put a question mark beside it because it's not clear that that's really a market good. We do have carbon markets, but that social cost of carbon and in my part of the world, we're talking a lot about, those are big numbers on what the cost of emitting another unit of greenhouse gases. That's really generated from the impacts on human health, from the impacts on labor productivity, impacts on coastal properties and property value. So it's affecting multiple markets in that context. And that's again, a connection between nature, climate services and our economies. The area that I work in is more on the non-market side. So things that aren't typically traded in a market. But here we have to do some detective work. We have to look at the linkages, even though these goods and services are not traded on a market, they still show up in our market data and our choices and our behavior. And I'll show some examples in a minute. Or in some cases, we know that people have preferences over these kinds of goods and services, but we have to have other ways to understand those values. And our last method is really using the fact that we've invested in these kinds of studies and how do we apply them to other regions or other cases. We'll talk a bit about benefits transfer or value transfer. So how do we do it? Well, we look at the connection between these environmental or non-market goods and observable behavior. People travel. They go to places that are, have nice environmental amenities. They engage in tourism or recreation. That's a signal that there's a connection between what nature's providing and our economic activity. We went to a bird watching site yesterday. We went there because there were birds and there was a beautiful uh, facility and we're attracted to that. And so we're exhibiting a behavior that shows the connection between natural capital and humans. 
Um, I talked about the housing choice, the fact that we chose a house that was next to a, par a park. We can see that in property choices, that people will choose properties and we're looking for the connection with air quality or scenery or water quality. And from that, we can dig out what the value of the contribution of the natural capital is to the economic system. Uh, people make labor choices based on health conditions or air quality conditions. Sometimes people have to spend money to avoid adverse environmental outcomes. And if the air is not clean, you might purchase an air conditioner or you'll purchase a water filter to address water quality issues. So they're real expenditures to try to address environmental quality challenges. There are still some things that we can't observe through behavior. So for example, the value of threatened species, if people have no easy way of expressing a preference or spending money on a threatened species, how might we value that? Well, over the last 40 years or so, we've made significant advances in what I call highly structured surveys to try to have conversations with individuals about what trade-offs they would make. So that's another mechanism that we would use. And as I mentioned, we'll also engage in value transfer if we have studies in other locations. What are some of these values? This is a bit of the flip side of it. How does nature influence economies? Things like water quality, water treatment costs, purchasing of water filters, health risks, those tie into our economic system. Flood risk reductions. If there are wetlands that serve to reduce flood risk, that protects properties, that's a real economic value. Climate services, we already talked about the fact that greenhouse gas emissions affect climate that will have an impact on health, on productivity, on properties. Um, recreation and tourism, non-timber goods and services. Yeah, again, yesterday in the area, we were learning about medicinal plants and the services that those plants play. They're not typically traded on markets, but they have value. We can observe that behavior, noise reduction, visibility, a whole host of ways that our behaviors link to nature and link to the way that we can think about measuring economic values. This is a bit of a linear diagram, but I, I use it as a mechanism to think, of, think through the problem. If we're investing in a particular project or if we're evaluating a particular policy change, we can measure what change that has on the ecosystem. How does it affect the ecosystem? Is it gonna make things worse? Perhaps there are pollution problems or there are land use problems that are gonna make things better. We're gonna measure that ecosystem service change. We're then gonna see how that affects people through their property choices or their health impacts. And then we're gonna value those changes. It's a real combination of different disciplines. Again, that's my favorite kind of work is work that cuts across disciplines and work with other scientists to address this issue. But it also gets us the entire link between what the investment is and what the outcome is. And if we don't have the direct methods to value these things, we might use benefits transfer. This is a more recent example. This is brand new work out of the US Office of Management and Budget. They're describing exactly the same processes that they're emphasizing for use within regulatory analysis in the United States. Similar kind of diagram, regulatory change, changes in social systems, changes in natural systems. How do they interact? What's the change in welfare, human well being? So, new mechanisms, new guidance documents that are really helping us improve the way that we value natural capital. That's a list of methods. Let me skip by that one. So, how's it worked? Check my time here. I think I'm doing okay. I'm going to talk about three kinds of examples of, again, this is from my part of the world, US, Canada, and some really exciting things out of the UK. Uh, I think there are three places that could serve as, in some cases, examples, but there are others around the world. Um, the US EPA has been using something called BenMap. This is a benefits mapping tool. Um, they actually have workshops so you can apply this in other parts of the world. They've had workshops in Asia, transfer this tool to other places. What do they use it for? They use it for regulatory impact assessments. So if they're proposing a new rule that changes air quality in some way, they're evaluating the health impacts, the productivity impacts associating with that natural service associated with air and including that in the benefit cost or the regulatory assessment, including it in monetary terms. And over time, you can see cases where the inclusion of those nat natural services has really changed the decision. If you didn't have those initially in the analysis, you might have made a different decision about the ruling or the regulation. So BenMap has had a, a, a tremendous impact in the way regulatory analysis has been done. 
The US has also recently, and Canada has adopted the same approach for measuring the social cost of carbon. So how do we measure what the impact of greenhouse gas emissions is going to be? The monetary impact is measured through the social cost of carbon. In the US, that's now incorporated in a number of states through how they price electricity, for example. The cost of carbon emissions is being incorporated into that, into regulatory analysis. So that's counted when you have a new project and it generates greenhouse gases, that becomes part of the cost ledger. A quick schematic, it's a bit of a busy diagram, but I think the takeaway from this is this is an assessment of regulatory impacts, impact analysis across the US over several years. If you look at that gray area, that's the use of BenMap. So that benefits mapping tool dominates the decisions within regulatory impact assessment. So it's the tool that's used to try to inform these regulatory changes. In my country, probably the biggest and most sophisticated initiatives have been around air quality and health. So the health benefits per ton of emissions is a, a project uh, initiated by Health Canada so that wherever you are in the country, if you're designing a new project and you know there could be air quality changes arising from that project, you can use this tool to measure the economic value of those, plus or minus. You can build that into your benefit cost analysis or your regulatory analysis. And similarly, they're looking at investments in health, health risk reductions. How do we design new policies, design new strategies? That's the health impacts of air pollution. Shows up in our regulatory analysis. If you look at the, the published descriptions of regulatory impacts, they'll include these kinds of numbers. Those are air quality, mostly around human health. I think there's a couple of really interesting initiatives out of the UK. One is Orval spatially explicit recreation values in economic terms. So if you're investing in a, a project, water quality, restoring a wetland, does it have an impact where it boosts recreation? If it does, and you know the location, you can use this tool to try to identify that monetary value. You can factor that into whether you want to invest or not. Spatially explicit, very interesting tool. They've scaled this up, the colleagues at uh, Exeter, to now that's something they call NEVO, Natural Environment Valuation Online. If you look at that bottom section, sorry, the chairs may be in the way, um, tool that brings together spatially explicit data. This is the new thing over the last decade. Exactly where is this project occurring? What's changing? What are the monetary values of it? Linking land use change, ecosystem services, climate change, tying them into helping us make decisions. This is incorporated into the UK's environmental assessments and how they actually can make decisions, but the public can also use it, which I think is an interesting outcome. And in Canada, we have a couple of tools, and I know there's lots of interest in advancing these tools around benefits transfer. Uh, databases of values that can be applied, sometimes in spatially explicit, explicit contexts, and used for different kinds of investment analysis. All right. We can't think it's perfect. There's still work to do. There's some challenges. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is the extent of the market or the accounting stance. So what, what does that mean? If I'm doing an analysis of an investment that has an impact on nature, whose values count? The country, the region, the globe? The number that I get is gonna change depending on who I decide counts. If it's just the country, that's gonna be smaller likely than the region or the globe. And where I think we see this is in the social cost of carbon. This is a terrifying picture, but I, I like to talk about it because it really brings things home. This is from work that was published a couple of years ago, uh, Tama Carlton in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. This is the projection of the mortality impacts of climate change up to 2100. Red is worse, blue is better. So what does this picture tells me? tell me? Well, firstly, it, it says that if I emit greenhouse gases, in principle, it has an impact around the world. It also has a different impact in different places. Some places worse, some places better. So we have a distributional context, but we also have a global impact. So what's the right accounting stance? Again, in the regulatory assessment in the US and Canada, the suggestion is global. That's challenging in some institutions and jurisdictions to think globally and there's opposition to that approach. So that's one of the most interesting vexing puzzles that we have. 
Another example of this kind of accounting stance is global tourism. Now these numbers, they, they kind of shocked me when I first started looking for these. 10% of global GDP is associated with tourism. Even if it's half of that, that's a big number. Now, who gets the benefits from global tourism? Yeah, there's some benefits within a country. There are benefits in a variety of ways that we can measure. But often it's people outside who are flying in. Do we include those people in the benefit cost analysis and the investment analysis? How do we do that calculus? So it's another example of what exactly should be within the bounds versus outside the bounds of our investment analysis. Second challenge is that uh, we want good evidence. We want to make sure that there is clear information that this project or policy is really having this particular impact. And that's what we call the evidence of causality. Is it really generating a reduction in air quality or an improvement in recreation outcomes? So we'd like to have strong science behind those. Again, the new data tools and the new analytical tools are really making this much more possible than we've seen in the past. But I think it's another one of the issues we have to wrestle with. So when I think about that little diagram that I showed you, I mean, we have this very linear and it looks like we move from the blue box and then that causes something in the next blue box and that causes something in the next blue box. And I'm focusing on the valuation side. So I'm trying to make sure that I've identified how the changes in the system affect values. But I think we also see that sometimes we're not sure that the evidence is strong that the policy has actually had that change in the ecosystem. We need good natural science, ecosystem science that links with the policy and with the economists to really identify that causal linkage. And again, it's not the nicest story, thank you, not the nicest story, but of course we've seen recently that assessments in some of these causal impacts show us that, well, maybe things weren't working quite the way we thought. Investments in Red Plus may be overstated, according to this paper, the reductions in carbon emissions when we look at it from a very strong evidence base. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. That means that we should rethink how we implement these kinds of changes. We should try to put the appropriate monitoring tools in place so we can measure just how much the impact actually is. But it brings us back to the science world of making sure that we've got the evidence to support the nature-based outcome and the value outcome. A Couple of other challenges on the data side there's so much new rich ecosystem science data. We're talking about it at lunch. There are satellite imagery, there are sensors, there are all kinds of interesting new data sources that are being pulled together about natural systems. We don't know as much about humans, about what humans are doing, about how they're interacting with nature, about how they behave. We have some good databases and they're improving, but I think that's the next step. There's also some, some challenges that we've seen recently in the use of surveys. Uh, fewer people are interested in doing surveys. We have some other data challenges with surveys. So we're wrestling with the data side of things. Still work to do. It's good. It's going to keep me in business for a while. I think in the benefits transfer side, we have to go into that with an open mind as well. I mean, yes, there are databases, but those databases depend on what people are publishing. And sometimes work that should have been published didn't get published. So there are gaps in that literature or there are publication biases. We also have to worry about how we transfer things from one country to another if we're doing international transfers. So continuing work on dealing with benefits transfer. And this last one, again, is you know, relatively new, I'd say, for economists to really dig into, and that's how do we assess the distributional impacts. Uh, one, and this is a bit controversial, one approach to this might be to say, yes, we can measure this group wins, this group loses. That tells us about the distributional impacts. I hate to try to think of everything in a valuation lens, but maybe we could ask the question, would a particular society actually have value in redistributing those resources? Would there be interest in smoothing out income flows or redistributing benefits to marginalized populations? Um, we tried to do a bit of that in a paper that, we, that recently came out in Nature Water where we're looking at with indigenous people in Australia, a marginalized population suffering from a variety of water quality and quantity issues, cultural services around water, um, would, the, uh, would there be a value in a benefit cost sense associated with restoring some of those services? And our benefit cost analysis in this paper says largely yes. 
that that would pass a, an economic benefit cost test to reinvest to dis redistribute water resources for indigenous people. Okay, almost done. A couple of frontier issues. Uh, that picture on the right, um, you can go online to eBird. This is a, a global database where bird watchers, my spouse is a particularly avid bird watcher. You'll see some pictures in a minute. You can go online and you can post what you're seeing. What does that tell us? That tells us a value of nature. People are going places to look at birds like we did the other day. It tells us about human behavior because I can look at that map and I can see there's more people here. There are fewer people here. They're moving from here to here. You can watch that set of dots move around during the day, during seasons. So we have now a new data source and many people are using these kinds of digital data sources to think about the value of nature and for us to bring those benefits back in because we're observing how people like those kinds of systems. Now we've talked here about using mobile phone data. And it's a little creepy, but your phone is always telling people where you are. Uh, and if you can anonymize that data and you can see that people are going to a forest or they're going camping or they're going somewhere else, we're gonna learn about their preferences for nature. And there's talk about using large language models, chat GPT to learn about people's preferences for nature. Again, that's a little weird for someone like me who's interested in data collection from people, but really what are large language models, but not aggregations of what people are thinking and saying and doing. So that's an interesting line of work. I think there are new pathways for valuation. Um, one that we're starting to see emerging is what's the connection between nature and mental health, anxiety issues, uh, other types of issues that perhaps nature can play a role in alleviating some of those. We need to make sure that this is causal evidence, that there's strong linkages that we can show that connection, but it's an interesting evolution in that pathway. I've already mentioned the fact that these natural services, and their values are increasing over time. We've seen that historically through health valuation, but now we're seeing it in general in ecological services. And lastly, that distributional or equity effects. Improved modeling. I think this is just part of the most exciting stuff in the world to see machine learning. All my students are learning machine learning. I tried last year, I went into a PhD class and I was learning machine learning. It kind of blew my mind, but it was fantastic to see the capabilities with new data sets, bringing them together, using artificial intelligence to identify what we're seeing in terms of patterns of behavior, interacting with the ecosystem. And then building those inter integrated models the people in that class were from various disciplines. They were geographers, they were economists, they were ecologists. They were working together with the same tools, the same science tools that bring together data. Then they talked about the problem from their different perspectives. Again, pretty exciting stuff. I wish I could go back and do another PhD now. I need to go back about 40 years and try this again. So let me wrap up. Um, I think, and especially over the last decade, we've seen tremendous improvements I'm pretty convinced that this is going to help us in making better decisions. The data are better, the techniques, the theories better. I think it's going to give us better outcomes. I think it's going to give us better outcomes in terms of distribution of who's benefiting, who's not benefiting. We know that these values are increasing over time. They're likely to continue that way. But we're also going to have to make some investments, I think, to really realize this. Investments in people training, skills, investments in the science, development of new data sources, but also investments in policy structure, structures that actually require these types of values in investment analysis. And I promised the birds, so I'll end off with one of my favorite sources of natural capital. Um, these are my wife's photos from around the world. This is really an exhibit of our interest in nature and natural capital and the value we place on it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this was uh, very comprehensive, I made some notes for questions. So if we can now invite the panel, please. Um, we have Virginia Batan. She's from the, um, uh, let me make that a ratio, from the statistics department. She's the chief, chief statistical specialist at the Environment and Natural Resources Account Division of the Macroeconomics Account Service.
So if you can come in, uh, please, Virginia, you have experience with introducing um, natural capital accounting. So we'll hear from you how this works. And then we have, uh, please, Mr. Roy uh, Dakumos. He's from the National Economic Development Authority. So you'll share with us a little bit about the policy landscape. And then we have uh, Duncan Lang. He's our senior environment specialist at the climate change and uh, climate change resilience and environmental cluster at the climate change and sustainable development departments. Um, and then we have here Michiko Kadagami, who is online, and she is the principal natural resources and agricultural specialist. So we'll also hear a little bit about the ADB um, context. So I had some questions before, which I received, but then listening. But now listening, I think we can follow a very interesting flow. Uh, we'll start first with uh, Vic talking a little bit about the evidence base and how MDBs can promote using this comprehensive evidence base and work with it. And then we'll hear from, um, then we'll hear from uh, Virginia a bit more about the data situation in country, for example, in the Philippines. And then we'll go to um, Rory and talk a bit about the value and how we look at value in, in policy. We then go to causality and hear from Michiko a bit more about how we bring causality into um, uh, working across sectors and themes in the bank. And then we'll finish with Duncan talking more about context and specific projects. So let's see if I'm able to uh, weave the story <laughs> into the question. So, Let's start with Vic. We heard from you about this comprehensive work. Um, you have probably worked with multilateral development banks. Uh, so the first question is, um, how can multilateral development banks build this evidence base, use the data and tools that are available already, and promote them through their work? Thanks. That, that's a great way to start. I mean, I think part of it at the beginning is investing in people so that they have the skills, they have the knowledge base so that they can use the latest tools to really assess whether this does support a decision with strong evidence. I mean, it's In a way, it's not new. In the medical sciences, that's been a requirement for many years to, to be sure about the evidence before we're implementing treatment. We're thinking the same way in economics now. Is it really clear that X is causing Y? And then we can use that evidence and, and support and the supporting values in the cost benefit analysis or the investment analysis. Again, I think that's been a revolution in the last decade is that our new PhD students are all being trained in thinking carefully about evidence to support the outcomes of economic policies or investment decisions. Yeah, so maybe one, one of the other questions, do you think this is normal and logical, but do multilateral development banks, for example, use um, the tools that exist already for valuation, ecosystem services, and, and natural capital enough? I would say not yet enough. I would love to see more, but I'm biased. I mean, I think there, part of it is that we need more data. We need data to try to support these, either the natural capital retrospective approaches or prospective approaches with benefits assessment. I think the skills are certainly within the people. And you know, we see, I see that at talking to people. But I think we also need to think about a uh, context where that's valued, where making sure that this is what we need to make a good decision. We want to make sure there's rigor. So, so as a climate bank, we, we have that mandate and we value this, right? So exactly. that's OK. Exactly. Thank you. Um, by the way, for all online participants, I can see that you already have dropped some questions. So I will come to your questions also um, uh, in a minute and weave them in. Um, so now let's hear from uh, Virginia. Um, we heard, you know, we should use evidence. Definitely the MDB should promote using evidence and, and using especially these, these tools for natural capital evaluation. Evaluation. How are you doing this in, in your role? What, what do you need um, to get this data, use the data? And what has been your journey in the Philippines to introduce natural capital evaluation? So thank you. Um, for the Philippines, uh, we have a long journey. I think um, the evidence is there with our experts who have been there through times. Blah, blah, blah. Um, this started since um, 1990s. 
from the Philippines um, during the environmental and uh, natural resources economic projects. Uh, it's the ENRA project during the 1990s and the salient feature, I think it's from the 1997 when the, an executive order 406 was established um, with the Philippine Environmental and Natural uh, Resource Capital uh, Accounting System, which is the PINRA. And um, way back 2014 up to 2017, we have the World Bank project, which is the wealth accounting projects. And um, as for the Philippine Statistics Authority, we have an output on the mineral accounts of the Philippines, which is currently being updated by the PSA. Um, and also we have the pilot areas of, uh, in terms of the mangrove ecosystem accounting uh, in Pagbilao area. And I think um, it is also, uh, the DNR also have um, some uh, WAVES project pertaining to the Laguna Lake development in the Palawan. And um, right now, uh, 2014 up to the present, we have continued the PINRA, PINRA project, which um, uh, funded our um, national and subnational compilation of environmental accounts to site. Uh, we have um, the regular updating of the mineral asset accounts of the Philippines, which uh, follows the or adapt the system of environmental economic accounting central framework. And also we have the energy asset accounts. Um, for the minerals, we have um, the four metallic minerals of gold, copper, nickel, and chromite. And for the energy resources, it's also an asset. Uh, we have the coal, natural gas, and condensate, oil and condensate. And we have developed also the water flow accounts, which uh, when we say flow accounts, it's the interaction between the natural uh, water as a natural input, um, which flows to the economy and within the economy and uh, what goes back to the environment as a mission. So, um, we are also working, uh, we have ongoing development, research and developments on several uh, environmental accounts following the um, CS Central Framework and the Ecosystem Accounting Framework, uh, wherein we, uh, we are engaged into the land accounting with the UN, uh, statistical divisions, uh, technical assistance, and also we have the timber asset accounts, the, um, we have also the uh, material flow accounts that uh, were, uh, it's uh, underway uh, to also connect with the PDP, uh, Philippine Development Plan results matrix. And also uh, we have a lot of energy flow accounts and uh, uh, right now we are also engaged in environment statistics and disaster related statistics. So the issues and challenges occurring to, to our compilation is in terms of the data, the availability of the data that would fit into the framework and also uh, the consistency with the system of national accounts since we are uh, on the macro side, macroeconomic uh, service side, and also, um, yeah, the human capital, which is in terms of the capacity building that uh, um, that we have right now since uh, our division, the Environment and Natural Resources Accounts Division composed only of nine, nine plantilla positions. So as you can see, there are lots of demands out there and we have um, the ongoing uh, bill that is still underway for signature of our uh, principles uh, on the in terms of the, it's in the Senate and uh, uh, for it's on the, on the way now. So um, lots of data available, yeah. although not consistently, and you need a bill, a policy um, to kind of institutionalize that. Yeah. yeah. Actually, we have the, um, uh, in 2022, we, the NEDA, along with PSA and the, and the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, launched the um, uh, roadmap to institutionalize the natural capital accounting, which is a tool um, uh, for uh, accounting not only the individual resources like the renewable and non-renewable, but also the ecosystem services that it's provided. Um, the, salient feature as i may uh, which the individual uh, accounts will be compiled by the philippine statistics authority while while the site specific ecosystem account will be compiled by the department of environment and natural resources 
Okay, thank you. So um, when you listen to um, uh, Vic is uh, and, and you hear, you know, what and obviously you stay on top of that, uh, what's happening outside, what would you need in an ideal scenario? Would you want to have more people, more resources, um, more policy? Uh, what do you think is required to advance uh, this work? I think what well, is the human capital? Uh, it's so happened that the framework is there. There are lots of uh, suggestions on what to compile and what the country needs in terms of the circular economy, the low, low carbon uh, policy, and also uh, how we value the natural capital vis-a-vis -vis with the gross domestic product, uh, it, how we will going to align this with uh, uh, the gross domestic product in terms of adjusting the macroeconomic indicators. So um, in the policy, yes, in the institutionalization uh, roadmap, uh, we have the component to which is the um, progressively, the Philippine Statistics Authority will do the adjustment in terms of the macroeconomic indicators. So this will be done through um, uh, Recently, the 2025 system of national accounts has, been, uh, has an on ongoing revisions, including the um, chapter on the sustainability of the well-being, which includes the natural capital accounting for specific uh, assets or, or for specific accounts like the land, natural resources, ecosystem, um, environmental activity, and others. So the, uh, we're looking forward to the framework and um, in lieu of that, we need people and we need capacity building uh, in terms of um, the people. Right now, um, our division is uh, relatively young. Okay. <laughs> we have younger people, yet um, they are good in technology, but uh, we need to be trained, uh, yeah. particularly on the framework itself and how uh what are the data yes. needed okay. and data we do lots yes. of data assessment and validation thank in you. our reports okay we, so we need capacity and people thank you thank you very much so um roy on the policy side right so um how can you elaborate a little bit on the on neda's perspective um how you see this policy work that will lead to more and better uh, valuation of natural capital, how is that moving forward? Um, how, what impact does it have for NEDA's work on, on planning and policy advisory service in general? And um, what challenges do you see? Uh, yeah, thank you. So in terms of uh, uh, planning and uh, policy decision making, and also in uh, making investment decisions, no? So I think uh, my general impression with the way we have done things over the past several years, I think we may have undervalued uh, the value of ecosystem services and uh, natural capital. A case in point is in the way we compute for the economic cost benefit analysis of uh, big ticket projects like infrastructure projects. Typically, uh, environmental, uh, uh, the, the environment aspect is treated just as an externality but as shown by the prof uh, presentation by professor Vic, we can you can actually include those uh, costs and benefits in the calculation of uh, economic cost benefit uh, analysis so you can actually endogenize uh, the natural capital and uh, the value of econ uh, environmental services so in that sense we, we would be needing uh, assistance on regarding the science how to do it the, the tools the data as mentioned by uh, member G. So that's one thing. Uh, we, we may have undervalued uh, the value of uh, natural capital and ecosystem services. But uh, on the part of NEDA, we have done our uh, preliminary work on that. Uh, after the field waves project, the, we, we piloted uh, the generation of asset and flow accounts. Uh, uh, moving forward, we would like to, as I've said, uh, endogenize, include this in, in, the, in, our, uh, you know, in our policy decision making and investment uh, decision uh, policies. And another thing uh, I gathered from the presentation of Professor Vigno, uh, regarding the compensation of uh, damages. So that again is, I, I think, uh, undervalued. Like, Example is last year we had the Mindoro oil spill. 
and the airing, airing company was made to pay 70 million pesos. But that 70 million pesos is 50 million for the cleanup and 20 million for the socioeconomic livelihood assistance. But what about the restoration of those damaged ecosystems, mangroves, coral, coral seagrass beds, coral, coral reefs? They did not pay. So with this uh, natural capital accounting, it will help us uh, in our uh, policies especially for uh, know, in, in compensating for the damages. So on, on that topic, you said um, under, you, you talked about undervalued in the past, yeah? What uh, do you think is required in terms of communication to get also buy-in from the population of, of the value of natural capital? Uh, what, 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 what sentiments do you think are in the population? Uh, the general sentiment is if, if you endogenize this, this in, in uh, natural capital accounting in the investment decision process is it will tend to increase the cost of the project financially. But the counter argument to that is if you factor in it, factored in it as a cost, you also reap the other side, the benefits, the carbon sequestration, flood mitigation, flood protection, those are the benefits of, uh, no. so in, in that sense, we need to communicate that uh, as a positive thing so that uh, it will increase the, enhance the awareness and appreciation of the general public. So the benefit, the positive benefit, talk about the positive, okay. Um, before we go to Michiko and Duncan, let's see here what we have um, online. Um, okay, we have a sensible question here, but I, I will take it. And this is about um, mining operations. And let's assume it's also rare, uh, rare earth that we are considering, not just traditional. And um, the question here is, I think it's for uh, Vic, uh, how can we measure the damage that a mining company is causing the environment versus the value of their initiative in the protection of the environment? Right, so if I understand the question, so any, often these mining activities will have adverse effects on the environment. So they could affect water quality, they could affect uh, bird populations. So I think we're getting much better at measuring those and so we can assess what those costs will be because they're costs to the natural system. And in an investment analysis, we're gonna be trading those off against what the benefits of that particular activity are. But I think we can go a step further. And we, we can think about how do we mitigate those benefits? Maybe, maybe we need to improve ecosystem somewhere else to offset the losses that arise from that particular activity. That's just one approach that valuation could help us with we're going to transfer dollars to dollars and offset the monetary impact and the damages with a positive outcome somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Maybe on the positive outcome of something, there's one question which is um, interesting, very specific uh, already is actually, um, so if you do an evaluation and establish a per hectare value of mangrove ecosystems, for example, for rehabilitating and recompensating from that investment in mining somewhere in, in, uh, in the ocean, uh, will it be okay to limit only selected ecosystem services for mangroves or should it really be the total economic value of all um, uh, of all uh, ecosystem services? So I have two points on that. Yeah. One, one is in principle, yes, it's the total economic value that arises from that specific location. So if you've removed a mangrove, there are a variety of different benefits that are gonna disappear. But this other side of that is it really depends where those mangroves are, are lost, mm -hmm. that these values are not the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. In some cases, they're gonna be very important because they're close to people, they provide services, fisheries, other types of services. So we really need to be careful on both sides. Yes, we love the total, mm -hmm. but we also wanna be spatially explicit. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very good segue now. Um, and sorry, Machiko, that you will come now last, but to Duncan, um, uh, because of the, the project impact so in which way can ADB, because we have the regional overview, assess certain um, uh, benefits or certain negative impacts from investments um, that, uh, that affect the local ecosystem, yeah, in, in, in relation to what that means for other places of, in, in, in the region uh, and their ecosystems? Uh, thanks, Suzanne. So, um, I'm probably quite a rare person in ADB that I 
I look at the safeguard side of things, which is kind of managing the negative, but I'm also in charge of an initiative which is uh, trying to scale up the nature positive side of things. Um, so I would say on the negative side with regards to the, um, you know, the drivers that are reducing that biodiversity or reducing those ecosystem services, um, this is an area, as we heard, that has been traditionally we've not been doing so much on. And actually, under our new safeguard policy, which is going to come out uh, later this year, we've actually got some specific mention of ecosystem services that we, where we identify places where there are those values that they, we, they need to be assessed and brought into assessment. So that will then mean moving forward that there's a kind of a general baseline of the level of ecosystem valuation for our projects and where the, those values are higher then you would have to do more because of you know the benefits that those they provide to different people um, but maybe on the positive side because i lead a, this regional flyway initiative um, what we've seen is that um, you know the when i first started i i like birds too right and uh, when i go and talk to the governments you know, much as I would love it if they like birds, they don't, you know, they're not that interested in birds, unfortunately. Um, they like, uh, you know, they have a development agenda. They have to deal with, um, you know, being re-elected to the government. They have all these other things, poverty, etc. So that's when we started to talk about ecosystem services much more. And we tried to kind of tell the story about all those ecosystem services that their sites, which are all on minor wetlands, provide regional public goods. And for example, I think the number that I have in mind is 65 billion is prevented uh, averted loss damage to 15 million people per year from uh, mangroves in the Southeast Asia and Asia region. So that is a benefit that is being provided. We don't know where these typhoons will hit, etc and those um, the mangroves are providing that service so you know this is a regional public good is uh, my flyway and our sites all link to each other as well so um, you have one bird that stops in in one country it may go to another we actually have shown that they they do do that so um, by linking to a bigger initiative we're able to make impact and i think that's one way in which adb at least can kind of try and drive changes by linking all these different small interventions together yes. to deliver something at scale. Yeah. Thank you. So um, maybe on that, uh, um, and I know Michiko, you, we need to show her now, so otherwise I'll <laughs> make sure. Um, so Michiko, listening to the conversation so far, right? And, and we had some discussion with, um, I mean, Vic mentioned the issue of causalities. Um, how do you see that um, development banks are helping governments to um, think about causalities and also maybe um, uh, uh, intra-government or inter-country relationships and impacts um, when we have these policy dialogues and, and, this, this, uh, and talk about the investment decisions. So causalities between investments and development projects and causalities between investments in countries which are connected through na nature and nature public goods. Thank you. I think uh, I think this causality discussion, I think it's going to be easier to discuss at the bigger picture in a globally when it's climate story is clear, no? And also the country level in a specific landscape. But when it comes to granularity of this, the who's actually causing what, you know, who's benefiting out of this uh, mitigation of this that the in adverse impact, I think it becomes very, very blurry. One thing that I want to bring into this uh, discussion is that the way we, um, by the way, I'm representing the agriculture, forestry, and natural resources sector group today. And the way we look at this uh, nature-based solution, we're, we're doing this at the ADB level, recognizing the sustainability issues of the public asset. And it's, it's very, very important. So there's a drive, even though we have a corporate target, and then there's also the funding made already. But uh, so this, this ADB's um, investment decision-making part, there's a lot of this uh, in, you know, interest in trying to apply this uh, um, valuation natural capitals. But I think I think there's an earlier discussion, like you mentioned, you asked the, the Suzanne and also this uh, um, Professor Vic already answered that 
Yes, we, we should do a lot more of this application of this so that we would have a little bit more specific building the cases of specific project is impacting, you know, that the benefit is this and that in the put the dollar terms, that's very important to push this agenda forward. So that's the ADB story. Now, when you go into our primary target beneficiaries, rural farmers, rural communities, we have 350 million smallholder farmers. That's our target prior, um, priority uh, target uh, beneficiaries. When they go ask about this a nature-based based solution, evaluation of that, that's not the priority that they have. They have, uh, you know, they're concerned about more income in the present than the future sustainability because most of them are not wealthy. Most of them are drive, driven by these uh, the today's earning and next year's earning, perhaps. So there's a temporal sort of discussion is ongoing about the development bank comes in and say, this is good. Country comes in and say, this is sustainable. This is not valuable. valuable. And they don't have an immediate sort of uh, the in incentive to invest into that. That's the that's clear from the evidence, literature evidence. Um, for example, this deforestation. I think there's a pest pecos, um, uh, ecosystem. Uh, uh, the payments was made for the forestry farmers. If the level is, is too low, they will not care about so much about the sustainability. This is the 20 years, 10, 10, 20 years commitment that they have to make when their concern is narrowing down as one year or two. Um, also, liquidity problem becomes a lot more concern for them than the future long-term sort of benefits. Um, there, when it comes to farmers, quality of this uh, sustainability of this water and the quality of the soil is really lifeline, but they don't have sort of luxury to care about that in the present time. So that's a problem. So I, I'm really interested in just that the, how the discussion will go. And then we see this uh, ecosystem services closely linked to the foods, um, food security issues. And not just for the environment, and then the, and it's directly linked to the adaptation capacity when it comes to the the, and the when you think about the 10, 20 years time. So this very, very important top subject. Yet this valuation, we have to look at a little bit more of the distributional issue. I think professional uh, Professor Vic mentioned this, that this is a frontier issue, I guess, but that we would have to have a little bit more uh, sort of solid you know, at the empirical and also the theory base is where development banks should do this a little bit more on that. And we are really willing to collaborate in that make a case of that uh, our investment team can actually apply this. There's a lot of enthusiasm in this, and but uh, in the practical term, in convincing the government in the valid, uh, value, value um, money, is it's much, much less is happening in, within this institution. Another thing I just want to draw and you know, bring into your attention is that I think that Professor Vic mentioned about this hor horrific global picture of this that that uh, um, impact of climate change on the uh, the uh, life expectancy. I think this was um, repeatedly utilized in a COP uh, uh, discussion also, but there's a lot of discussion happening at Yale universities and also the um, I think recently I think the. Uh, um, Esther Duflo has been making a lot of pitch on this, saying climate change will make the inequality worsen. So this compensation system properly value the value the benefits streams of this value of this ecosystem services in Asian context, it's going to be made by millions and millions of smallholder farmers. They're the guardians. Incentivize them to commit to this. And then we would have to show this monetary term somehow. I mean, we have to put the dollar mark to that. Otherwise, we don't see that changes happen. And, and um, we are very hopeful about this and engaging this agenda. And thank you very much for inviting us today. Thank you. Thank you, Michigan. I'll come back to you later on this issue of um, um, mandatory policies versus uh, education at the at the small farmer uh, and, and, and landowner level. Um, but let's talk first. Uh, let's ask um, Royal here from NEDA. Um, do you think a policy measure that really says every investment, development investment has to be um, evaluate, evaluated, natural evaluated, and cost benefits have to, have to be shown and value distribution has to be shown, would that help? to make better investment decisions when it comes to development projects? 
Yeah, I think so because uh, as I have mentioned uh, in the past, we have tend to we have tended to undervalue the services being provided by the environment. And so what what happened is uh, for the longest time, we experienced uh, environmental degradation, and then we have to spend again to restore ecosystems. And why not put it at the very start? Make sure that it's already built in in the investment decision phase. For example, in uh, mining. So, how much do we charge for the rehabilitation fund? Mm -hmm. So, in the case of uh, mining, uh, the government sets a as part of the tax uh, a certain amount so that at the end of the the life of the mining site uh, it will be rehabilitated. But we don't know if that amount will be enough to re fully rehabilitate that uh, area. So mm -hmm. with the natural capital accounting, with the ecosystem valuation, we will be properly guided. How much do we collect for rehabilitation fund of uh, uh, abandoned or uh, uh, those uh, mi mining, air mining sites that have been uh, uh, exhausted already? So uh, in, in the moving forward, I think it would really help in our uh, investment decision-making process. So this was one question also from the audience here. Um, there's a question between uh, what about the trade-offs between urban planning, land use, and environment, and um, how this framework uh, could be used. So I think you answered uh, this already. Uh, but maybe one question to, um, to Vic now is, so if one country takes this very seriously and says we are really looking at na um, natural um, capital valuation and we are accounting for it and we are imposing that in investments decisions and another country doesn't do that um, wouldn't that mean that you know foreign direct investments and industries would rather go to that other country uh, what kind of global <laughs> agreement or uh, governance is, is required um, to to manage this that, that's a very interesting question and I, and I think that's a valid point that we could create these kinds of unlevel playing fields. And that's where a regional approach and an institutional approach would really serve much better, or even in through various trade agreements and, and multilateral trade agreements could play a role in that. We're seeing that now with climate change and carbon. We're seeing discussions about those kind of multi-country connections. So I think that's a, a really interesting question and in how we tackle it at a regional or global scale. Yeah, so maybe I'll ask that question, uh, Michiko and, and Duncan. Um, how would you, how, how, how is the world going about it and, and how should ADB support whatever is happening at the, at the global level to create, you know, playing, playing fields? Uh, I think it is challenging, really challenging. Um, but I do think even at a national level, um, like I can give you an example from my country has recently just in the last, uh, half a year has brought in a rule on biodiversity net gain. So for every new development they have, it's a regulatory requirement. They have to deliver 10% net gain for biodiversity. But one of the things that creating this regulatory environment does is it then creates an entire industry all of itself. So you create all these players that are now trying to work out how to deliver biodiversity. And they were never doing that before because the regulatory environment did that. So I think that that type of model, maybe at a regional level or under a regional agreement, could be a way to go. But there are many of the international conventions, you know, the Convention from Biological Diversity, um, you know, many of the, the requirements for these international agreements are um, not mandatory necessarily. People sign them, but they're not ratified, that type of thing. So I think that's maybe a way to go and scale up and then maybe you would create these regional trading platforms where um, you know, people would be willing to invest in biodiversity, but it will also create its own uh, industry itself, if you like. Thanks. Thank you. By the way, for the audience, so if you have a question, please come to the uh, microphone so that we also can take questions here from the, from the live audience. Um, while you think about your question, because I hope that you will ask questions. Uh, back to Michiko. Uh, Michiko, what, can you give some examples uh, where ADB has incorporated the valuation of natural capital and ecosystem services in designing projects, like specific project examples? 
Unfortunately, I don't have my own project doing that, but the, 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 I'll tell you why the, why it's not really happening. But in Vietnam project, for example, if there's a, the rural development project, they've been taking the certain sort of valuation of the ecosystem services in, incorporated into that. And in, in fact, ADB doesn't really apply the specific methodology of this valuation setup. It's, it's not really set up, but uh, it, it, the, the procedure values the assets and uh, the, the ecosystem sort of the services from the, for example, this is the typical project is that, that we've been doing in the Vietnam is the watershed management project where this up uh, upland the community does the sustainable the forest trees and the embankment of the uh, the coverage and it's the reforestations to secure the water sources and the sustainability of water flowing down to downstream the downstream community is willing to pay for that uh, quality of the water uh, for example that sort of uh, services that uh, that the system or the landscape investment that has been happening but it's a very small scale and also the valuation of ecosystem uh services was very very low so take up i think is the take up by this participations of the upland community was not really that that we expected but uh, i think a recent project i think duncan might know, know a lot more of this example that what is happening in the investment there's a lot of technical assistance happening but in, when it comes to investment we're not really we, we should do a lot more interesting thing that we're going forward what we're doing this now is in Laos, for example, that we're doing the forestry development project. We're looking at the, all this aspect of this uh, new sort of a, a mechanism for the upland low round. And also we we particularly looking at the distribution aspect to sustain the forestry system because it's the, they're, they're facing a dire problem where, you know, the farmers, uh, because of the commodity price hikes, they want to they want to plant uh, cassava than so keeping the, the nice forestry for just a subsistence sort of a, the forestry so picking of this non type of forest products so it's becoming a little bit more like a business you know this harsh business as a competition about what the um, guardian of this that the land uh, users you know, land, land resources and water resources is choosing to do um, so it's about the evaluation of natural assets, but also we would have to think about this, uh, go a little bit beyond to make that, create the business incentive that works for the whole entire, you know, landscape or economy. Yeah. So we have an interesting question here from, um, Jinge and, um, maybe that's, um, I don't know if it's that it's, I mean, relevant for everyone because you can, you can, um, apply it also to a government um, situation. So the question here is ADB is currently updating its result framework for its indicators for the, for the current strategy. So you can say the same thing for a national government, which is updating a national development strategy. And the question is here is, could any of the speakers share their views of the meaningfulness of ecosystem services as a progress indicator for sustainable development in general, given practical considerations such as current status of data availability and so on. So could we actually have it as a um, as a results indicator that we are helping uh, to use ecosystem service, support ecosystem services and invest in those? Maybe for you, Vic, because it's a difficult Short academic answer. question. Yes. yes, definitely. Okay, yes, yes. And, I'm and looking think... at, we have someone here from strategy department, okay, looking at, at him here. <laughs> yeah, I think, and, and that's really the, the natural capital framework. Yeah. That's a measure of sustainability. If, if that value of natural capital is declining over time, that's a sustainability indicator, whether it's at a regional scale or a national scale, or even sometimes at a watershed scale. Yeah. It's a way to, to monitor and measure and then react if yeah. we're not sustainable. Okay. Yeah. So, um, would you like to add to that, Virginia? I think in the Philippines, it's quite uh, early to 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 say. But um, we really need the basic data. Like um, for us in the Philippine Statistics Authority, we we are compiling the physical, the physical asset accounts, the physical flow accounts. Why? We need to strengthen that. Do we? Uh, we really need to know the 
the how many stocks are there in the environment like for for the minerals for the energy for the non-renewable since it's it will not uh once extracted it will not come back in the end time of your lifetime and um how uh the production or the extraction really um uh from year to year uh going what's going on within the production since you're going to extract um non-renewable resources and also for the water i think um for the physical supply and use of water you, you'll be able to know who um who who uses and who's uh where is uh the sources of this water came from uh and then we we can measure the efficiency of the use of these resources so um moving forward since we are computing for these three um natural resources and we try to uh take the monetary aspect on that in terms of the um, net present value or the uh, natural resource rent. Mm -hmm. So this uh, will um, be our uh, source for, in terms of uh, reference in the adjusted mm -hmm. macroeconomic indicator, mm -hmm. since um, uh, we're going to value also what are the effects on this in terms of the ecosystem services, like uh, the provisioning service, mm -hmm for water, mm -hmm. for the energy resources and the mineral resources and the likes. And also our developmental accounts, which uh, like the land, which we um, use the land cover statistics, um, the changes on the, on the, on the, the land itself on, on the cover will tell us what happened during the 2015 or during 2020, what happened to the land cover of the Philippines. Um, and this physical, physical assets or physical flow will eventually be an input to the adjustment okay. of the macroeconomic indicators in the future. So it's an evidence base, um, even though that um, this will not clearly or um, uh, we have some some SDG indicators that we come up like for the water, it's uh, the water use efficiency, the level of water stress, even though um, it's just in the physical yes. form. Good. Uh, uh, how it is being um, um, factored in the, the in terms of uh, who uses uh, so much water, yeah. uh, what type of industry, and uh, okay. where is water. the water yeah. uh, being um, abstracted okay. to? So, so that's that's the point. Um, it's you. a reference to uh, even in the ecosystem valuation in the future. Good, thank you. So, um, Roy, uh, one thing is to do this at the national level. But how do you incentivize or tell local government to actually measure sustainability and look for investments that create new industries and ecosystem services? Ecotourism was brought, brought up here, but really um, evaluate sustainable, evaluate and evaluate sustainability. So uh, before that, uh, ultimately, we would like natural capital accounts to be part of our development uh, plans and uh, results matrices. No? But uh, right now, we are not yet there. But uh, our priority is more on the generation of data, uh, accounts compilation. So we are uh, relying on uh, PSA. But uh, in, in the in the bill that's, that ho that uh, I hope hopefully in the next few weeks that will come out as a law. Uh, it's part of the you know, the promotion and advocacy of the the use of natural capital accounting in a, in a development project. So uh, one of the strategy there is to make sure that uh, there are units within the government that are that will be that will be in charge and mm -hmm. also that will be uh, a task to to, to help PSA in generating those uh, ecosystem accounts and also uh, leveraging the expertise of the academe mm -hmm. in terms of uh, ecosystem valuation. So it's actually the, the approach is a whole of society approach. Mm -hmm. Everyone should be involved mm -hmm. in, the, in, in implementing uh, natural uh, capital accounting. Thank you very much. Any question? Yeah, we have here a question. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Erica, market analyst. So thank you for the comprehensive um, presentation. Um, this is somehow related to the global governance question a while ago. So in my, cause in my work ex experience, since the data I usually get faced with is from the private sector. 
to private sector companies market data from different industries, including consumer behaviors with the environmental sustainability impacts of the business activities, etc. So the International Financial Reporting Standards or IFRS with the International Sustainability Standards Board is currently doing research in order to incorporate climate impacts and biodiversity loss in nature positivity financial flows in global accounting standards for better investment decisions. So it's on company level. And as we know, so some companies are bigger or cuts across countries or continents. So how do you foresee this effort and the data that could be available integrating with the natural capital accounting on country level from the public sector to perhaps see the bigger picture and how we collectively stand in how we account for nature, which is a common resource. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, that's a huge question. So Duncan, you'll take the first part. Yeah, well, I can start. I think Vic and others would be very welcome to come in. Uh, so actually, funnily enough, I actually do our sustainability report and uh, we, we do a report against one of these international benchmarks, which is the Global uh, Reporting Initiative or GRI. Um, the, there's the trend now, there's the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures, which was the guidelines were launched uh, in September. Uh, ADB is currently thinking about whether we may or may not report against it. Uh, so IFRS as well, I think yesterday they they talked about what they were going to do or they were going to look at biodiversity in that context too. Um, so I think um, most of the big MDBs like ourselves are kind of lining ourselves up to be reporting against these international standards. Um, I think one of the benefits of using these standards is you compare apples to apples rather than apples to oranges. Um, we have internally created a number of um, taxonomies related to climate, uh, how we report climate numbers. And we are also done that recently for Nature Positive, which we launched at COP28. So I think we're kind of working on that stuff. But what we do in with the MDBs and then IFRS, where they have most of their people are private sector, is something slightly different. So we're kind of in this space at the moment where we're trying to work out how we can integrate ourselves within them where we need to um, at the moment. But I think throughout this whole integration process, there will be a lot more data that is available uh, and that will then help with us to be able to manage biodiversity and climate uh, impacts better in the future. Hope that was helpful. Thanks. Yeah, I think we have to wrap up. So I hope that you can get the rest of your answer from um, the rest of the panelists after we wrap up here, this um, uh, seminar, this webinar seminar, hybrid seminar. Uh, <laughs> um, so maybe to summarize here, what we heard is there's a lot more evidence available and there are a lot more ways to generate evidence on the uh, impacts of nature, the benefits of uh, protecting nature and creating um, nature services, uh, natural nature services. We heard that data is being generated, but it's still difficult because we still need to build capacity all over the world in developed and developing countries, especially as the uh, tools are changing and we are creating a lot more integrated data systems and we have now AI, which hopefully it helps us to make it faster. We spoke about the value. So we need policy to show that we value nature. We need, of course, also more education of the population. We need to change um, that people, you know, don't value fast investments, quick money now, but actually the sustainability. And then we heard about um, causalities across different sectors and how we have to think about that and communicate that differently. And we heard about the context. So investing in one country, in one specific province has an impact maybe somewhere else in the world. And uh, we could leverage that, but we also can also, of course, uh, create um, difficulties and harm with that. So the, the role of the bank, obviously, of ADB is to, to promote this a lot more, to support capacity development, to use these tools, to integrate them, and to make sure that our investments are nature positive and um, support how we value, invest, and uh, protect and uh, regenerate nature. So thank you very much for everyone. There is, especially for the panelists, big hands of applause for you. For you. Um, we have another um, 
series of the Asia Development Policy Lectures, and it's um, in May 23, and this is about um, elderly, right, aging populations, what aging population. There's actually some interesting connection because aging population is good for the environment. There's some research on that too, but I think that's not the topic of the webinar. So with that, thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone, and uh, once again, thank you.